all storytellers and story lovers. My name is Lakshmi Tata. I host and produce the Jaipur Bites podcast, where you can hear many of the amazing sessions from the Jaipur Literature Festival. I also produce a few other podcasts, as you can see right here: English, Hindi, fiction, non-fiction. If you see something you like, maybe you can take a screenshot of this right now. I'll give you a second, and tune in later. Find them on your favorite podcast app. Hello, we at the University of York in the UK are proud and delighted to support this session. This event celebrates the growing partnership between JLF, the University of York, and our own festival, the York Festival of Ideas. Our university and our festival share with the JLF the de- desire to broaden horizons and to celebrate the world of ideas. In the spirit of virtual events, we invite you to join us virtually from wherever you are in the world. Whether you are a student thinking about studying in the UK or you simply want to find out more about the university or our beautiful city York, we invite you to join us at york.ac.uk. Thank you. Namaste. It's my pleasure to represent the US mission to India at this very special Virtual Z Jaipur Literature Festival. Attracting people from around the world This Jaipur based festival is now a must attend event or as is the case this year a must tune into event. Our relationship with the festival goes back to 2009 when we first sponsored the participation of eight American writers. The festival helps demonstrate the strength of the US India relationship thanks to the broad engagement between our nations. Indeed, our support with JLF is now facilitated by our North India office which was created in 2015 to deepen the ties linking Rajasthan and seven other northern indian states and territories with the united states today the us embassy is honored to sponsor this special session with author jonathan safran for to highlight the united states commitment to combating climate change president biden has made confronting the existential threat of climate change a top priority for his administration special presidential envoy for climate john kerry has engaged with india in some of his first actions in office He participated in the World Sustainable Development Summit with Minister Jai Shankar and spoke with Minister Javadekar. This early outreach reflects the importance of cooperation with India on climate change. There is much to be done in India, in the United States and around the world. I am confident that the US and India will rise to this challenge as the world's two largest democracies and the world's first and fifth largest economies. But there's also a responsibility for individuals to do our part. Author Jonathan Safran Four focuses on this very aspect. It's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Safran Four, author of We Are the Weather: Saving the Planet Begins at Breakfast, which was published in June 2019. He's the author of three best-selling novels: Everything Is Illuminated, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, and Here I Am, as well as two works of non-fiction: Eating Animals and The New American Hagada. Mr. Four is joined by Jeffrey Gettleman. South Asia Bureau Chief of the New York Times and Pulitzer Prize winner. He's also the author of Love Africa, a memoir about his experiences in Africa. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. We are delighted to welcome you to the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Detol. Straight from the front lawns of Diggi Palace. We now present We Are the Weather. Saving the planet begins at breakfast. Jonathan Safran Foyer in conversation with Jeffrey Gettleman a powerful narrative on the stark realities of climate change we are the weather saving the planet begins at breakfast by Jonathan Safran Foyer takes a hard hitting look at the day to day human contribution to the unfolding environmental catastrophe weaving personal stories facts and metaphors he also analyzes what motivates some people to sacrifice short term comfort for the sake of the long term preservation of our climate by eliminating animal based products from their diet in conversation with journalist jeffrey gettleman he delves on the changes that each one of us can make to mitigate this crisis Jonathan Safran Foyer is the author of 3 award-winning and internationally best-selling novels Everything is Illuminated, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close and Here I Am, as well as two works of non-fiction Eating Animals and The New American Hagada. 
Jeffrey Gettleman, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, is the New York Times South Asia Bureau Chief based in New Delhi. He was previously the paper's East Africa Bureau Chief based in Kenya. He's the author of Love Africa, a memoir about his experiences in Africa and a whole bunch of other things. Do comment by typing it in the comment section. We now present We Are The Weather. Saving the planet begins at breakfast. Jonathan Safran Foyer in conversation with Jeffrey Gettleman. Over to you, Jeffrey. Thanks for the wonderful uh, introduction. And Jonathan, it is a um, huge honor to be talking to you live, even if it's virtually. <laughs> I remember um, when your story came out in the summer of 2001, a short story you wrote, The Very uh, Rigid Search. And I remember that piece so vividly and even where I was when I read it the first time. Uh, incredible piece of writing. And well, where thought, were you? I was in Evanston, Illinois at my parents' house. And I just love that piece. And I thought, that guy's a badass. Yeah. So, we, we were both very young men then. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah a different life. Yeah, um, different world. And a different world. It was right before September 11th. Mm -hmm. So we have some big things to talk about, and it's really nice to, uh, to have that pleasure of, of talking to you about this book. Um, tell, us, tell us like what the book is about and why you wrote it. Sure. Well, first, I want to thank the festival for having me. Um, I mean, it's a strange use of that word, uh, given that we are remote. Um, but when I was invited to participate, of course, I said, yes, I've heard only wonderful things about this festival, but I did add the, the one condition that um, I will do this on the condition that you invite me in person when that's possible again. And I, I really, I can think of um, nothing that I would uh, more happily look forward to than being able to attend the festival uh, next year. So maybe you and I can have this conversation in the same space couple of beers on a table between us, maybe even an audience that can ask questions in real time. Uh, that to me, uh, when, you know, stuck in these quarantines, that's a nice way to mentally and emotionally escape. Oh, man. Um, in, in terms of the book, why I wrote it, you know, I, I as you, you had a, a, a memory of reading a short story of mine, uh, I guess that was about, what, 20 years ago almost. 18 years ago, something like that. 20, no, it was 20 years ago. Um, I was a novelist then, and I still think of myself as a novelist. Um, I have never been, um, I've never loved the process of writing nonfiction, and I, I have never felt that I've been particularly good at it. It doesn't feel like it's where my passions or talents lie. That said, I, um, I've always written, there's an old saying or an old joke, I guess, that once upon a time, there was a person whose life was so good, there's no story to tell about it. So, you know, stories are always born out of a problem. And um, that's, that's been my experience, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, with fiction, I don't exactly know what the problem is. I can't easily articulate it. Just something is it is sitting uneasily inside of me or something is unresolved and fiction is an effort not to solve any problem, but maybe to give it words or to, to share it. Nonfiction for me um, has been about problems that I can name. Um, I know at the beginning of the book, what it is that's eating away at me uh, as it were. So uh, Eating Animals was the first nonfiction book that I wrote, and that was in response to, to something that had been a problem for me since I was a kid. Um, it's pr one of the oldest problems in my life, which is um, how do I feel about eating meat? Um, because I've been a conflicted eater for most of my life. Um, with We Are the Weather, that was also born out of a problem, which I could articulate, which was how is an individual to live in this moment of climate crisis? You know, I, I knew what the science was because everybody knows what the science is at this point. Um, I knew what the rhetoric was 
I knew what kinds of posters to make for what kinds of marches that I should attend, but on the level of daily life and the choices that I would make for myself, for my family, I didn't exactly know, or at the very least, I was aware that I wasn't doing a whole lot. Um, that was a problem that was I found actually quite easy to ignore most of the time, but was there um, in the background. And at a certain point, maybe because uh, about two or three years ago, it felt like the climate crisis, and this is hard to now remember because it's been, the news has been taken over by Trump and by COVID and by Black Lives Matter. But there was a, a little window about two or three years ago when it really was at the forefront of all of the news, um, week in and week out, day in and day out. And I think it brought my internal crisis to a head or that internal problem question to a head. And, um, you know, I'm lucky to be a writer because I have, I am able to set aside time and space to think things through. You know, I can do that as a profession. And so um, I decided to set aside some time and space to the question of how to live as an individual in this moment of climate crisis. Well, Jonathan, the book is so beautifully written and really persuasive. Um, at times it reads like a geometric proof where you sort of establish certain facts and then come to conclusions. And other times it feels like a really rich story. Um, one thing I found especially interesting was your idea that if a problem is so big, it's almost unbelievably bad. Um, if it's so big and horrible, we can't wrap our heads around it, um, that it paralyzes us into inaction. And you talk about the Holocaust, how when, when and, and uh, you know, we all know these stories that as it was unfolding and the word was beginning to trickle out what was happening in Europe, so many people are like, oh, no, that's impossible. It can't be that bad. And they didn't do anything. And you and you compare that to what's happening with climate change. And these and these predictions are so awful. They're they're unbelievably bad. And that makes us not able to absorb it and to and to and to and to act. Tell us a little bit more what, what about that and, and how we can overcome that. Well, you know, so climate change is in no way unique um, in being something that we can know but not exactly believe. Um, I could probably think of 10 things in the course of the day I'm about to have that will fit into that category. Um, you know, the most obvious one is that we're all going to die. It's something that we all know, but we find ways not to think about, maybe even to the extent that we we don't actually, we, we lose our... Um, we stop, we stop believing that it's going to happen, which is what allows us to, you know, like who, who if, if he or she was really aware of, a, of having a finite life would watch Netflix for four hours a day or would, you know, engage with social media for three hours a day or would look at their phones all the time. We would live really differently if we could in our hearts rather than just in our minds know that our time is finite. Um, there, so, so I used the Holocaust not exactly because the Holocaust and climate change are complementary events, but because both illustrate um, this problem that in human psychology. Uh, and I, I tell a story, which is kind of the centerpiece of the book, which I return to it at various times, about um, a young man named Jan Karski, who was a Catholic in the Polish underground, who um, um, fled Europe um, bringing testimonies from the Warsaw Ghetto, from extermination camps to America to try to persuade Western leaders to intervene. Um, I should say, uh, he tells the story himself on YouTube. It's really worth watching him tell it. He has an incredible presence and charisma. And um, I worry that when I tell it in the book, it sounds almost fable-like. Like the story is has a kind of platonic perfection that can be easy to appreciate, but... Um, it's worth remembering these are real people who, who until quite recently were still alive. So he made it all the way to America and one of his first meetings was with Felix Frankfurt of the Supreme Court Justice, who was widely considered one of the smartest legal minds or minds of any kind that America's produced and who was himself Jewish. And he 
told Frankfurter what was happening in Europe, none of which was exactly a revelation, but um, you know, hearing it from a person sitting a couple feet away from you, of course, has a different effect. And he shared the testimonies and photographs um, and other evidence. And Frankfurter peppered him with questions. You know, how high is the wall of the Warsaw Ghetto? Um, how many people are in the extermination camp? How does it function on a day-to-day -day basis? And then he paced the room and he sat down and he said, look, a man like me speaking to a man like you has to be totally frank. And I have to tell you that I can't believe what you've just told me. And Frankfurter's colleague who was with him said, how can you not, how can you say he's lying? You know, he came all the way from Europe at incredible personal risk. He's presented all of this evidence to you. Why, what incentive would he have to lie? And Frankfurter said, I didn't say that he was lying. I said that I am unable to believe him, that my mind and my heart were made in such a way that I can't believe it. And, um, you know, at this point in time, we really don't have a problem. Very, very, very few people um, are under the impression that scientists are lying to us about climate change. There is a very broad consensus that human caused climate change is happening. And I don't just mean among one political party. Um, in the United States, um, about 77% of Americans believe in human caused climate change. Uh, no, excuse me, 77% of Americans wanted the US to remain in the Paris Climate Accords, which is you know, a, a robust statement about belief in science. But um, even knowing what we know, I think most of us, and I include myself, often find it hard to believe. So, okay, and that, and that is one explanation of why people don't act just like it was during the Holocaust. How can we, how can we overcome that? It's so big, it's so bad, it's so dire. Well, it's not clear that we can. Um, it's a huge impediment to action. You know, um, it's interesting actually to compare COVID, um, why it is that we had the response that we did to COVID um, why it was that individuals were willing, by and large, to quarantine, why individuals were willing, by and large, to wear masks, to wash their hands regularly, um, why it is that cities were willing to shut down their economies, that the country was willing to shut down the economy, to, um, you know, radically change, um, um, you know, policies of who can travel where and when, what kind of businesses can operate. Um, I think it's because we were afraid and not afraid in an abstract way and not afraid for other people and not afraid for those living in the future, but afraid, actively afraid, fearing for our own well-being. Um, you know, if Donald Trump had said, we need to shut down our economy for some period of time. We need a $2 trillion stimulus package. Otherwise, people in Bangladesh are gonna get coronavirus. I think there's no chance in the world that that would have happened. If Donald Trump had said, we just need you to wash your hands. That's all we need, just wash your hands regularly and thoroughly. Otherwise, people in Bangladesh are gonna get coronavirus. I don't think people would have even washed their hands. So, you know, you can understand that. One way to understand that is to say, well, people are evil or people are so narcissistic that they can't make even the smallest leap of empathy in order to help others. Or you can just say, this, is, this seems to be what humans are like. Um, we have a long, long, long track record of being this way. It's not to say we're incapable of acts of generosity or empathy, but it's hard. To, to make those empathic leaps. It's hard to mobilize change when it isn't out of self-interest. So what are we gonna do? Because climate change does require that leap of empathy, working against climate change. Um, there are people right now who are suffering and who are dying because of climate change. But um, by and large, they aren't the perpetrators of climate change. They aren't the people who are living in the countries that are most responsible for, for what we're now facing. 
Um, so how do we persuade people or persuade leaders in those countries who are not themselves afraid, personally afraid of the effects of climate change to act? Um, that, that is the challenge in front of us. In my book, I look at it not so much in terms of um, legislated change and systemic change, which um, is necessary. I look at it though uh, from the lens of, or the perspective of individual change, which is also necessary. And how can we as individuals overcome our own psychologies to do the things that are necessary? Um, and, and my feeling is it has to do with norms and routines. Um, you know, if I were to ask you, um, if you go into a store and you see something that you like, how do you persuade yourself not to steal it? Like, do you have to have a memory of the social contract? Do you have to have a strong feeling about the shopkeeper and why you wouldn't want to take money from his or her pocket? My guess is you would say, I actually don't really have any kind of internal debate at all. I just, I don't steal because I don't steal. That's who I am. So we need to somehow find a way to turn ourselves into people who just don't steal from the planet or don't steal from the future. Um, and I think the best way to do it is to take the burden off of belief, you know, to take the burden off of the, the need to have some kind of strong thought or feeling and instead just shape our habits. Um, so in the book, I write about food and eating in particular, um, which we know is the most important um, choice that we make as individuals vis-a-vis -vis the environment. Um, if we can set up uh, some sort of regimen for ourselves, like a set of habits that we don't really think about, we just do them because that's who we are and that's what we do. Um, that is a is far easier and far more likely to succeed than this like everlasting debate with ourselves. But it, it's breaking bad habits. That's that's the that's the trick. Like we've already been going in a certain direction, and we have to we have to change. Um, Something you say, you know, something you write about the inequality of, uh, of climate change, because I've, I've worked in Africa in the developing world, and I've seen this with my own eyes, that the people who suffer the most, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, there's many people that live right on the edge of very arid areas, and a few degrees warmer, it's going to be totally in inhabitable, uninhabitable. Um, those people produce almost no pollution. They live like they don't produce a lot of waste. They don't use a lot of energy. They don't use a lot of water and they are the most vulnerable. And you, you hit this issue in your book really nicely with this comparison of cigarette smoking. And you said, what, what's it, you know, this is basically like rich people, the people in the rich country smoking a ton of cigarettes and the people in the poor countries getting cancer. And I thought that was like, a, you know, a really nice way of, of driving that issue home. Um, I'm obviously a big fan. Uh, <laughs> let's. I want to. I want to talk about the about the food issue because that's a huge part of what you're interested in, what this book is about, and what your previous book is about. And you you lay out facts really nicely, and you talk about the amount of carbon dioxide equivalent that is um, necessary to produce servings of different foods. And <clears throat> beef is is 6.61. Cheese is 2.45 pork is 1.72. It goes through the different types of food we eat, eggs, milk. And as you get into um, vegetables, the, the amount of carbon dioxide necessary to produce a serving of vegetables is very low. Carrots is 0 0.07. That's almost a hundredth of what it is for beef. Um, but you yourself struggle with following this perfectly. You yourself struggle with just eliminating meat because it's part of our habits. It's, it's a habit you have to break. And I just want to read a passage that, that you lay out um, about this. You say, in my early 30s, I spent three years researching factory farming and wrote a book length rejection of it called Eating Animals. I then spent nearly two years giving hundreds of readings, lectures, and interviews on the subject, making the case that factory farm meat should not be eaten. So it would be far easier for me not to mention that in difficult periods over the past couple of years, while going through some painful personal passages, while traveling the country to promote a novel 
when I was least suited for self-promotion, I ate meat a number of times, usually burgers, often at airports. See, in India, this isn't a problem because it's very hard getting red meat, um, which is to say meat from precisely the kind of farms I argued most strongly against. And my reason for doing this, my reason for doing so makes my hypocrisy even more pathetic. They brought me comfort. I can imagine this confession eliciting some ironic comments and eye rolling and some giddy accusations of fraudulence. Other readers may find it genuinely disturbing. I wrote at length and passionately about how factory farming tortures animals and destroys the environment. Now I'll ask you this question that you pose in your book. How could you argue for radical change? How could you raise your children as vegetarians while eating meat for comfort? Well, you can imagine that that was unpleasant to write that part. And um, that was, I don't know if you experienced this in your writing. I, I imagine you do when, you know, there's a passage that you write and then you take it out and then you put it back in and then you take it out and then you put it back in. Um, you know, it, that, that was, that was tricky because it's, it's embarrassing and it's, it's like sh it's shameful. Um, but it's also honest. And, um, I think that it is actually a fear of embarrassment and shame and a fear of hypocrisy as well. That stops a lot of people from taking steps that they want to take. You know, we, we look at these issues as binaries, um, probably because they make us feel vulnerable. Um, whatever your position on meat is, um, everybody recognizes that we're talking about something pretty serious, you know? Um, it happens every now and then that I would I give a reading um, on the subject and somebody will stand up and say, you know, who do you think you are telling anybody else not to eat meat? And this is what my parents ate and my grandparents ate and it's healthy food. And it's, and the way I always respond is <clears throat> we obviously agree that this is important. You know, if I had, if I had been giving a talk about why we should drink carbonated water instead of, still water. Nobody would stand up and get upset. If I gave a talk about why we should drive hybrids instead of gas powered cars or use LEDs instead of halogens, nobody would get upset. Um, people get upset because they instinctively know that the stakes are high. When we're, it's, I mean, it's literally life or death. And um, we now have a good sense of the environmental implications, animal welfare implications, the implications for workers and rural communities. So I think a good starting point is this matters and um, it matters in a way that makes us vulnerable, that often makes us feel aggressive or defensive and that we have um, shared values. Like whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or um, live in urban or rural life, whether you're religious or not, whether you're old or young and whatever your race, um, we want to decrease the amount of destruction that's going on. And we want to decrease the amount of violence. Um, and there are a lot of ways to reach that end, those ends. Um, you know, if you were to ask me, what are the odds that half of Americans will be vegetarian in 10 years? I would, I would say zero. Um, what are the odds that half of the meals eaten in America will be vegetarian in 10 years? I believe that will be the case. So if we're looking at it from the perspective of identity, those are very, very different things. If we're looking at it from the perspective of outcomes, reducing the amount of destruction and reducing the amount of violence, then they're identical. But we're so used to only being able to think about this in terms of identity, you know, the perfection of your own identity. Um, that's why we have so many and such convoluted names for how one eats. You're a vegan, you're a vegetarian, you're a pescatarian, you're a flexitarian, you're a reducitarian. Um, I used to think about it in those ways as well. I think because I was vulnerable, both vulnerable and because it feels good to claim an identity, but we have to be very careful about those good and bad feelings, um, leading us away from the outcomes that we actually want. Um, 
if instead our conversation had a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more forgiveness, a little bit more humility, um, if we were able to, to say, look, I know what the right thing to do is by my own standards, not by anybody else's, but I know what I think the right thing to do is. And I know that I can't always do that because I have cravings, because I'm lazy, because just because we're imperfect, you know, because we're people, um, then we might actually be able to accomplish a lot more. You know, at the end, uh, it happens all the time, almost at the, almost uh, almost every time I give a reading, somebody will come up to me and say something like, hey, I read your book. I've been a vegetarian for three weeks. It's going strong. I'm feeling good. And on the one hand, that sounds great. On the other hand, I will often say to them, you know, just make sure you're setting yourself up for success and not failure. Because what you're saying is for 21 meals, you've now been a vegetarian. What happens if on the 22nd meal you eat some kind of meat? Well, then you're not a vegetarian anymore. There are five times as many former vegetarians as, as there are vegetarians right now. Um, and I think it's because we think of that term. I mean, that term is an all or nothing. It's a binary. You are or you aren't. If instead that person had come up to me and said, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what you said about the relationship between food and the environment or animal welfare or whatever. And I've been trying to eat as little meat as possible. And I haven't eaten any for three weeks. If that person then at the 22nd meal eats meat, he can say 21 out of 22 times I did it. And, you know, that gets you into the hall of fame. That's a, that's great. That's an amazing success rate. Um, as opposed, so, you know, just, just by tweaking the way that you describe what you're trying to do, um, the exact same outcomes can be understood as a complete failure or an amazing success. So I, I, I prefer not to think about these things in terms of rigid identities, but this kind of cause and effect chain that we want to participate in. Um, <clears throat> what do you think about the idea that, and you put this in your book, you say man has been a hunter and gatherer for, um, it was like 12 minutes to midnight if, if the human existence was a day or something like that, right? The idea is that primitive man was living much differently than we live today for most of the existence of the human species. Some people say we're meant to eat meat, like our bodies are designed to have a little meat now and then. How do you reconcile that with the, with the need to change our habits to save the environment? Well, if, the, if you said to me, can you imagine a planet where people eat a little meat every now and then? I would say that would be a very, very different planet than the one that we live on. And we wouldn't have the same environmental problems that we have. Um, the problem that we have now is people are eating, you know, two thirds of their plate is filled with meat at least twice a day. Um, we, uh, the amount of meat that we eat now is as if every citizen on the planet in the year 1700 ate, uh, drank 1200 gallons of milk and ate about 800 pounds of meat every day. So, you know, a lot of that is due to the population explosion, obviously. And a lot of it is due to the fact that we're just eating huge amounts of animal products relative to what we used to. So, um, you know, I would begin by saying I've never met a nutritionist who, agrees with the statement that we need to eat meat. Um, meat, like a lot of other foods, like cake, you know, can be perfectly healthy. Um, it's just that we wouldn't want to eat too much of it. And we know that it's linked to heart disease, cancer, um, and, uh, and all kinds of other health problems. But I, I, I think that like, there's a kind of like, rigidity behind that observation or a stubbornness. Um, you know, when people say that, um, there, there are an awful lot of things that hunter gatherers did that we don't do now, you know, that we have evolved to have different understandings about how genders relate to one another, notions of equality, um, human sacrifice, cannibalism, uh, you know, uh, hunters and gatherers don't wear eyeglasses. Is that an argument against my wearing eyeglasses now? Of course not. Um, I think it is worth acknowledging that humans have, most humans have eaten meat for most of human history. And that, that's an important fact. And I don't, I'm not dismissing it. Um, 
you know, my vision of the future isn't futuristic, actually. It's, it's conservative. It's moving back to a kind of farming that our grandparents practiced and moving back to a kind of eating that our grandparents practiced. Um, I don't want to eat meat um, and I am not going to eat meat. And I am as healthy as anybody else. Um, but I also, my interest isn't in imposing my specific choices on everybody else. My interest is in sharing the indisputable and unambiguous science with everybody else. Um, and when it comes to climate change, the science couldn't possibly be more clear. Um, the IPCC, which is like the gold standard for climate science for the United Nations, um, has said that we have no hope of meeting the goals of the Paris Climate Accords unless we change how we eat, um, and specifically with respect to animals. Um, so there is this funny place where the conversation, the conversation about meat um, has an objective foundations, um, and not only with respect to climate change, but with respect to animal welfare. I mean, we know um, what this specific system of animal agriculture that we now have, factory farming, does to animals. Um, but then there is a, a place, you know, where we won't all be on the same page, where it does start to become more about instincts, instincts about the suffering of others, the importance of the suffering of others, um, the value, the relative values of things like craving or cravings or food culture. Um, and once we get to that place, I don't, I don't feel insistent at all. I, I feel very, very strongly about the kind of choices I want to make and the kind of person I want to be, but that's a, that's a different story. So when you said eating some meat every now and then, maybe that's right about at the line where we should all be able to agree that we can't do more than that. We, we won't, we don't have a sustainable food system if we're eating more than some meat every now and then, but after that, then there's, there's room for like a respectful disagreement. Well, I look forward to having a cheeseburger with you when you're on that moment, when you allow yourself one. Um, An impossible burger. And, I, and, I, and I've, been, I've been following your advice here in India because I don't have a choice. Um, climate change, you're right. Climate change is not a jigsaw puzzle on the coffee table, which can be returned to when the schedule allows and the feeling inspires. It is a house on fire. The longer we fail to take care of it, the harder it becomes to take care of. Um, I find your writing like really just impactful. And I wanted to talk to you for a few minutes before the end of this session about, about how you write. Um, can, how, how do you become a better writer? What's your advice for people if they want to be better writers? Well, you know, and it, I almost have to ask you some questions now. Like when you say it's impactful, I think it's a, it's pretty easy to be an impactful writer in the same way that it's easy if you throw a you know Celine Dion score over a movie it's pretty easy to make people cry at like the right moments. The question is how do you create an impact over time? And that's what's at the bottom of this book as well. Like you know Mark Twain said quitting smoking is the easiest thing in the world to do. I've done it 35 times. Like change is easy. Having big emotions is easy. Um, having a crush on somebody is easy. Marriage is hard. Like change over time is hard. Um, and so that's something that I really wrestle with in writing because as I've gotten deeper into my career and learned more about craft and read more books, you become aware of the tools for manipulation and those can be very tempting, but they're not gratifying as a writer and they are ultimately not gratifying for readers either. So when I was writing this book, I thought a lot, you know, I've, I've read a bunch of books about climate change that were impactful until they weren't, you know, I would read them and say, Oh my God, I've got to change everything. I've got to take to the streets. I'm going to, start, I'm going to write an email to everybody I know. And then literally 10 minutes later, 
I was just on to my life again and I'd pretty much forgotten about it. Um, so I wanted to try to write a book that would be sticky, you know, that would, but let's just talk, let's just talk about writing for a second. Like how do you improve your, you know, your, your ability to express yourself? Like how does somebody do that? In a way it's a trick question because myself is always changing as well. You know, like, um, it's not as if I have one self and over time I've been looking for better and better ways to express and share that person. Um, my interests change. Obviously my, my, the context of my life has changed. I have kids. That was a really big one. Um, so there are different things that I'm trying to express over time and writing itself changes me. Um, you know, WH Onan once said, I look at what I write so that I can see what I think. Um, especially with novels, it's not the case that I have some argument to make or a voice inside of me that I've discovered or characters who I want to share. Usually I don't have a lot. And in the process of writing, I start to see what it is that I've been caring about the whole time. So that's a roundabout way to, to try to actually give you an answer, which is I try to um, be as open as possible to surprises and to my subconscious. Um, I, I teach at NYU and I often do this exercise with my students. Um, if we had more time, I would do it with you right now because it's pretty fun where I will ask one of them, like, tell me something that's just on your mind right now. Whatever it is, it could be the smallest thing in the world. You could be thinking about, um, you know, hand sanitizer. You could be thinking about a huge chandelier you once saw in a concert hall, anything. And that person will always have something. And then I ask the student next to him or her, what does that make you think about? Anything, just like really subconsciously, just instinctively, what does it make you think about? You don't even have to know why or know what the connection is. And then I go to the next student. What does that make you think about? So, so when I was a very young writer, I thought I had it all figured out. And I thought I had good ideas that I was in control of. And I realized I didn't have that much um, in, in a kind of deliberate sense. The real material I, I had was going to have to come through some sort of mining of myself. Um, and so my writing is not in at all dissimilar from that exercise I just described to you, you know, very, and, and if the beginning of we are the weather kind of reflects this, like it bounces really intuitively from like anecdote to anecdote, historical episode to personal episode. Um, it's definitely not moving on an, on an obvious line or trajectory. Um, when I write, I will often start the day at least by asking myself, what's on my mind right now? Like I happen to be looking out a window. I live in a very old house and the windows are kind of wavy, you know, in the way that old glass is. And so, okay, I'm thinking about wavy glass and what does that make me think of? It looks a little bit like, um, you know, the air above a campfire when it starts to bend and warp in that weird way. And what does that make me think of? Um, it makes me think of like when I was a kid uh, dropping, a, uh, roasting a marshmallow and it would fall off the stick into the fire. And what does that make me think of? It makes me think of how my mom would comfort me afterwards and the, what was good and what was bad about that kind of comforting and so on and so forth. And then that kind of process can lead me to a place that I never, ever, ever would have chosen or anticipated but how but can is, you reconcile that with a plot? Like maybe that works for trying to share something. I'm, well, I would say two things. One, I'm not that worried about a plot. Um, that's I, I didn't become a writer be because I love storytelling. Um, I became a writer because I love something about like the experience or atmosphere that a work of art can create. And plot may be necessary, but it's not the point. Um, the second thing I would say is I think our minds crave structure and sense. And I have found that when I work, some part of my brain is taking care of organization, even when I'm not conscious of doing so, or when I'm not making it my priority. And um, third, 
uh, I also then become an editor at some point, you know, so it, there's these like two somewhat distinct parts of writing, one of which is the creation of material. And then the second is the organization of that material. So I find the organization to be simple compared to the creation. When I say simple, it's still incredibly hard and frustrating. Um, and I never feel like I'm as good at it as I wanna be, but compared to producing material, it's, it's easy. Um, what's really hard is getting things onto the page that are actually interesting to me. Um, you know, then there's the question of readers, which is, which is something different, but um, 99% of what I write, I put on the page, I don't find interesting. Or maybe I should say, I find it merely interesting. It's not worth it. It's not like, you know, to return to the beginning of our very beginning of our conversation, when, when you have that memory of that your life is finite, that puts a lot of pressure on the way that you spend your time. And as a writer, it can make it very, very difficult to look at anything and say that this was worth it. You know, what happens far more often, and, and I mean it, like about 99% of the time, I look at something I write and I think the world doesn't need it. I don't need it. What's the point? Like, wouldn't I be better and wouldn't the world be better if I was out there making sandwiches for homeless people or doing any number of things whose impact is obviously good? Um, so it's really difficult to find that 1%. Um, we're, we're, we're out of time, but I think this has definitely been worth it. Uh, finite life or not. And it's been, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and, and reading your work over the years. And I encourage anybody watching this to read this most recent book and go back to your first uh, short stories and to just get a sense of who you are as a writer. And I just want to thank you on behalf of this uh, festival for joining us. Thank you. You're so generous. And why don't we just make an agreement that we'll meet in Jaipur next year? You're on, man. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan and Jeffrey, for that very interesting and relevant conversation in today's time. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Do stay logged on to continue to watch with us in Darbar Hall and Front Lawn, a series of exciting sessions that we have specially curated for you. As you're aware, the cultural sector has been critically impacted by the pandemic and while we have braced ourselves, and embrace the new normal, we did struggle to ensure that we continue to bring to you a free flow of knowledge and ideas. We'd love your support towards Teamwork Arts. Any contribution is welcome. Do remember to tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2021 and tag us at Jaipur Lit Fest. The festival is protected by Detol. Hope to see you in our other sessions.